I never imagined a single sentence could shatter my world. Evelyn, give Nathan a child, or we'll push for a divorce. The words from Mrs. Whitmore, my mother-in-law, echoed in my head, each syllable a hammer strike to my heart. I'm Evelyn, a 32-year-old former marketing specialist turned housewife. My life story took a pivotal turn when I met Nathan, back when I was thriving in the corporate jungle. He, with his occasional charming smile amidst serious business meetings, had unknowingly cast a spell on me. I remember gathering every ounce of courage to ask him out, only to be met with a bittersweet rejection. He had a girlfriend. But fate played its hand. A month later, he stood before me, single and willing. He confessed that my upfront confession had stirred something in him. His relationship was already on rocky grounds, and my bold move was the nudge he needed. I felt a tinge of guilt, wondering if I was the reason for their breakup. Nathan, however, reassured me with his usual calm demeanor. Evelyn, it was bound to end. You just made me realize it sooner. Our relationship blossomed, and three years later, we were exchanging vows. Nathan had one request. He wanted children, and he wanted me to be a dedicated housewife. The timing felt right. I was burnt out from my toxic job. So with dreams of a blissful domestic life, I stepped into my new role. Initially, the transition was like living a dream. Our days were filled with laughter and love. I savored every moment, every shared meal, every cozy night in. The proximity to my in-laws, just a ten-minute walk, initially seemed daunting. But my fears were unfounded. They welcomed me with open arms, especially Mrs. Whitmore. She was the epitome of warmth, always ready to lend a hand or share wise advice. You're the daughter I never had, she'd say with a tender smile. But as years rolled by without the pitter-patter of little feet, the warmth began to wane. Mrs. Whitmore's demeanor shifted so drastically, it felt like dealing with a stranger. She began to drop by unannounced, each visit laced with veiled criticisms and not-so-subtle hints about grandchildren. The pressure mounted when Nathan's attitude towards starting a family shifted. In our early days, his desire for children was clear, but as time passed, his enthusiasm fizzled out. He'd brush off my attempts to discuss the matter with excuses, tiredness, work, or his latest video game obsession. I confided in Mrs. Whitmore, hoping for some understanding, but empathy was far from what I received. Her once supportive words turned into relentless pressure. A grandchild is a wife's duty, she'd say, her tone laced with accusation. The stress was unbearable. Nathan and I decided to seek fertility treatments a glimmer of hope in our strained relationship. But this step only further alienated Nathan. He withdrew into his world, leaving me to face the treatments and his mother's growing hostility alone. One evening, after another lonely day, I confronted Nathan. The frustration and loneliness poured out in a torrent of words. We need to talk about us, about our family, I pleaded. His response was a cold shrug. I don't see the rush, Evelyn. Let's just let things happen. But things weren't just happening, and my patience was wearing thin. I yearned for a change, a break from this cycle of disappointment and loneliness. Little did I know, the change was closer than I thought, and it would start with a revelation that would turn everything on its head. The months following were a cascade of unspoken words and mounting tensions. Mrs. Whitmore's visits became more frequent and oppressive, each one a stark reminder of our childless state. Evelyn, time isn't on your side. She'd chide, her voice sharp as a knife. It felt like she relished each jab, each veiled insult. Nathan's disinterest in our predicament only added fuel to the fire. Our conversations about starting a family dwindled to nothingness, replaced by silence or curt exchanges. The man I once saw as my partner in life now felt like a stranger sharing my home. The breaking point came unexpectedly. One evening, as I was tidying up, I stumbled upon a stash of receipts, evidence of Nathan's lavish spending on gaming and nights out. It was a slap in the face, a blatant disregard for our shared future. I confronted him, holding the receipts like a verdict. Nathan, what is all this? When did our dreams become so unimportant to you? He just scoffed, his eyes barely leaving his computer screen. Dreams? What dreams, Evelyn? The ones you had? Not mine, certainly. His words stung, but I persisted. We talked about this, Nathan, a family, a future together. He finally turned, his eyes cold. That was then. This is now. Things change, Evelyn. I felt a chasm opening between us, one filled with broken promises and unmet expectations. 
my efforts to bridge it were met with indifference or annoyance. The man I married was no longer the partner I envisioned in building a family. As the days turned to weeks, the situation at home became unbearable. Nathan's once rare outbursts became frequent, his temper short. I walked on eggshells, dreading his next explosion of frustration. Mrs. Whitmore's visits grew more confrontational. She seemed to derive some twisted satisfaction from my misery. Maybe you're not trying hard enough, Evelyn. A real woman knows how to keep her man happy and give him children. Her words were like venom, and I struggled to maintain my composure. I'm doing everything I can, Mrs. Whitmore. It's not as simple as you make it out to be. But she was relentless, her presence in our home a constant reminder of my perceived failure. The pressure was suffocating, the judgment inescapable. The fertility treatments once a beacon of hope became a source of despair. Each visit to the clinic was a reminder of our failing attempts. Nathan's support was non-existent. He accompanied me more out of obligation than desire. During one particularly harrowing visit, the doctor suggested we consider other options, perhaps even counseling. But Nathan dismissed it outright. Counseling? For what? This is just a waste of time and money. I felt abandoned, my dreams slipping away like sand through my fingers. The loneliness was crippling, the silence in our home deafening. The man I once loved was now the source of my deepest pain. In the midst of this turmoil, a shocking discovery turned my world upside down. A routine checkup revealed the unexpected. I was pregnant. The news should have been a joyous revelation, but it felt like a cruel irony. I kept the pregnancy a secret, unsure of what to do or how Nathan would react. The joy of motherhood was overshadowed by the reality of my crumbling marriage. The thought of bringing a child into this toxic environment was terrifying. As I grappled with my new reality, I realized something had to change. I couldn't continue in this cycle of despair and loneliness. A decision had to be made, for the sake of my unborn child and my own sanity. The path ahead was uncertain, but one thing was clear. I couldn't let this continue. The time for change was now. The revelation of my pregnancy was a secret I guarded closely, a flickering light in the growing darkness of my marriage. But before I could even process this news, another storm was brewing on the horizon. It was a bleak Tuesday morning when Nathan, unusually present at breakfast, dropped a bombshell. I quit my job, he said nonchalantly, his eyes fixed on his phone. I stared at him, my fork suspended midair. You did what? Nathan, why would you quit without discussing it with me first? He shrugged, disinterested. I wasn't happy there. Besides, it's not like it matters to you. His casual dismissal of such a crucial matter left me reeling. Our financial stability was now in jeopardy, and yet he seemed utterly unconcerned. The responsibility of our future, and now a child, weighed heavily on me. As days turned into weeks, Nathan's joblessness became the new normal. He spent his days glued to his computer screen, immersed in virtual worlds, while I struggled with the reality of our situation. One afternoon, as I was sorting through bills and trying to budget our dwindling savings, Nathan burst into the room. His face was flushed with anger, an ominous sign. Evelyn, what's this about a charge for craft supplies? You know we need to be saving money. I looked up, bewildered. It's just a few dollars, Nathan. Crafting helps me relax. His reaction was explosive. Relax? We're on the edge of financial ruin, and you're thinking about relaxing? His words stung, but I stood my ground. We wouldn't be in this situation if you hadn't quit your job without a plan. The argument escalated, with Nathan deflecting every concern with accusations and blame. You're just a freeloader, Evelyn. You don't understand what it means to earn a living. I was aghast at his audacity. Here I was, carrying our child, trying to keep our life afloat, and he dared to call me a freeloader. The irony was bitter. As I lay in bed that night, a plan began to form in my mind. I couldn't bring my child into a world of resentment and anger. I had to protect my unborn child from the toxic environment that our home had become. The next morning, with a steely resolve, I confronted Nathan. We need to talk about our future, Nathan. This can't go on. His response was a sneer. What future, Evelyn? You think I don't know you're unhappy? Go ahead. Leave if you want. His words were a catalyst. I reached into my drawer and pulled out the divorce papers I had prepared in secret. Fine. Let's end this charade. Nathan's arrogance faltered for a moment as he looked at the papers. 
You're serious? Deadly, I replied, my voice unwavering. He scanned the document, his facade crumbling. You can't do this, Evelyn. Think about what you're doing. I have, Nathan. I've thought about it more than you ever did about us. He signed the papers with a shaky hand, a mixture of disbelief and resignation on his face. As he left the room, I felt a wave of relief wash over me. It was the first step towards a new life for me and my child. But even as I braced myself for the challenges ahead, I couldn't shake off the feeling of dread. The battle was far from over, and I knew that the road ahead would be fraught with more obstacles. But for the sake of my child, I was ready to face them head on. The ink on the divorce papers hadn't even dried when the true extent of our financial ruin came to light. Nathan's carefree spending and lack of savings had left us with barely a cushion. And now, with the divorce proceedings underway, the grim reality of our situation became apparent. I was sitting at the kitchen table, poring over accounts and legal documents, when Nathan walked in, his demeanor unusually calm. So, how are we splitting the assets? he asked, a hint of greed in his tone. I looked up, masking my contempt. There's not much to split, Nathan. Your spending saw to that he scoffed, leaning against the doorway. Come on, Evelyn, what about your savings? The money you had before we got married. A cold laugh escaped my lips. You really think you're entitled to that? That money is mine, Nathan. I saved it long before I met you, his face contorted in anger. That's not fair, Evelyn. We're married. What's yours is mine. I stood up, my resolve firm. Not anymore. The savings are not part of the marital assets, and as for the condo, it's in my name. I bought it before we married. Nathan's face drained of color. You can't do this to me. I have rights. But I felt a surge of bitter satisfaction seeing him so powerless, a stark contrast to the domineering man he had been. Your rights ended when you signed those papers. You have no claim to my property or my savings. The reality of his situation seemed to sink in. His bluster faded, replaced by a dawning realization of his impending destitution. In the following weeks, the condo sale was finalized, adding to my financial security. Nathan, on the other hand, was left to face the consequences of his actions. He moved back in with his parents, a defeated man. As I packed up my belongings, a sense of liberation washed over me. I was free from the toxic marriage, free to start anew. But the greatest triumph was yet to come. I moved back to my parents' home, their support unwavering as I navigated through my pregnancy. They were overjoyed at the prospect of a grandchild, their love and care a stark contrast to the coldness I had endured. The day I gave birth to Leo was the day I truly understood the meaning of unconditional love. Holding my son in my arms, I made a silent vow to protect him, to give him the life he deserved. Nathan remained blissfully ignorant of his son's birth. I kept it a secret, knowing that revealing it would only invite chaos into our lives. It was a decision I made for Leo's sake, a shield against the toxicity of his father's family. As I settled into my new role as a single mother, I found strength I never knew I had. The craft store I frequented offered me a managerial position, a chance to rebuild my career and provide for Leo. Life had come full circle, and as I looked at my son, I knew that the hardest battles were behind us. We were on a path to healing and happiness, a future bright with possibilities, but fate had one more twist in store. One day, as I was arranging displays in the store, the bell chimed, announcing the arrival of customers. I looked up, expecting regular patrons, but instead I saw the last people I ever wanted to encounter again, Nathan and Mrs. Whitmore. Their presence was like a dark cloud, a reminder of a past I had fought hard to leave behind. But I was no longer the same woman they had tormented. I was stronger, braver, and I had Leo to fight for. The confrontation was inevitable, but I was ready. I was ready to protect my son, to defend the life we had built. The stage was set for the final showdown, and this time I was not going to back down. The air in the craft store grew thick with tension as Nathan and Mrs. Whitmore stepped in. Their eyes roamed around, finally settling on me with a mixture of surprise and, in Nathan's case, a hint of regret. Evelyn, running a little shop now? How quaint! Mrs. Whitmore sneered, her voice dripping with condescension. I forced a polite smile, standing my ground. It's more fulfilling than you might think. How can I help you? Nathan shuffled uncomfortably, avoiding my gaze. We, we heard about the divorce. I suppose congratulations are in order. 
The bitterness in his voice was palpable, but I didn't flinch. Thank you, Nathan. It was for the best. Mrs. Whitmore's eyes narrowed. For the best, you say? Leaving my son in shambles? Claiming all the assets for yourself? I met her gaze steadily. I only claimed what was rightfully mine. Nathan knows that. Nathan's face reddened, a mix of anger and shame. Evelyn, about the savings in the condo. I cut him off, my tone firm. We've been over this, Nathan. The matter is closed. His frustration was evident, but he was powerless. The realization that he had lost everything, not just the marriage, but also any financial security, seemed to hit him hard. Mrs. Whitmore, not one to be easily deterred, shifted her tactics. Well, then, let's discuss the real reason we're here. Her words piqued my curiosity, but I remained cautious. And what would that be? With a twisted smile, she dropped the bombshell. We know about the child, Evelyn. Your son, our grandson. The room spun for a moment as I processed her words. How did they find out about Leo? I had been so careful. Nathan's eyes lit up with a mixture of surprise and something akin to triumph. So it's true, then? You were pregnant during the divorce? I regained my composure, facing them head on. Yes, I was. But that changes nothing between us. Mrs. Whitmore stepped forward, her eyes gleaming with a mix of greed and determination. It changes everything. That child is a Whitmore. He belongs with us. Her audacity was astounding. Leo is my son. He has nothing to do with you or Nathan. Nathan, finding his voice, joined in. Evelyn, be reasonable. He's my son, too. I have rights. I shook my head, disbelief and anger swirling within me. You lost any rights when you signed those papers and walked out of our lives. The argument escalated, their demands growing more outrageous. They spoke of custody, of visitation rights, of integrating Leo into the Whitmore family. Each word was a strike against the peaceful life I had built for my son. But I stood firm, my resolve unshaken. You will not lay a finger on my son. This discussion is over. As they left, their threats and accusations lingered in the air. I knew this wasn't the end. They would be back, and I needed to be prepared. I had fought too hard to give up now. Leo was my world, and I would do whatever it took to protect him from the toxicity of the Whitmores. The battle lines were drawn and I was ready to defend my son at all costs. The Whitmores had underestimated me once. They wouldn't make that mistake again. The threat of the Whitmores loomed over my newfound peace like a dark cloud. Their unannounced visit to the craft store was just the beginning, a prelude to a battle I had hoped to avoid. Yet, in the depths of my heart, I knew it was inevitable. They would not relinquish their claim on Leo without a fight. Weeks passed with a deceptive calm. Each day I juggled managing the store and caring for Leo, all the while keeping a vigilant eye out for any sign of Nathan or Mrs. Whitmore. My parents, aware of the situation, were a constant source of strength and support. Then, one fateful afternoon, as I was arranging a new shipment of fabrics, the bell chimed. My heart sank as I looked up to see Nathan and Mrs. Whitmore enter, their faces set in grim determination. Without preamble, Mrs. Whitmore launched into her tirade. Evelyn, we've given this a lot of thought. It's only fair that we have custody of Leo for part of the time. He needs to know his father's family. Nathan nodded in agreement, his eyes avoiding mine. Evelyn, it's the right thing to do. Leo is my son, too. I felt a flare of anger at their audacity. Right thing? Since when did either of you care about what's right? You abandoned us, remember? Mrs. Whitmore's lips twisted into a cruel smile. Oh, Evelyn, always playing the victim. It's time you faced reality. Leo belongs with us. Their words were like venom, but I refused to let them see me falter. Leo is my son. He will not be part of your twisted games. Nathan stepped forward, a hint of desperation in his voice. Evelyn, please, I'm his father. I deserve to be in his life. I met his gaze, my voice unwavering. You lost that right when you chose your selfishness over our family. Leo will have nothing to do with you. The tension in the air was palpable, the stakes higher than ever. They were not going to back down, and neither was I. This was a fight for my son's future, and I was ready to go to any lengths to protect him. As they left, their threats hanging heavy in the air, I knew this was far from over. They would return, perhaps with legal reinforcements next time. But I was not the same woman they had once manipulated and belittled. I was a mother, a fighter, and I would do whatever it took to keep Leo safe from their toxic influence. The battle lines were drawn, and I was ready.
I had faced their worst and survived. Now it was time to show them that I was not to be underestimated. For Leo's sake, I would fight with everything I had. The Whitmores had awakened a strength in me they never knew existed, and I was prepared to use it to protect my son at all costs. The days following the confrontation at the craft store were tense. I fortified myself for the impending legal battle, consulting with a lawyer to safeguard Leo's future. My parents, ever supportive, reassured me of their unwavering backing. One late afternoon, while I was tending to the store, the bell chimed. My heart sank as I saw Nathan and Mrs. Whitmore enter, their faces twisted with a resolve that spelled trouble. This time, they were not alone. A stern-looking man, presumably their lawyer, accompanied them. "'Evelyn, we've come to a decision,' Mrs. Whitmore declared, her voice laced with a cold finality. "'We're filing for partial custody of Leo. It's only fair.' Nathan, standing beside her, added, "'It's not just about us. Leo deserves to know his father.' Their presence, their demands, it was all a grotesque déjà vu. But this time, something in me snapped. The fear and hesitation that once held me back evaporated, replaced by a fierce protectiveness. No, I said firmly. You won't drag my son into your twisted world. I won't let you. Whitmore scoffed. Don't be foolish, Evelyn. You can't keep him from us. Before I could reply, the door swung open. My parents walked in, their arrival unexpected but immensely comforting. My father's stern gaze met Nathan's, an unspoken warning in his eyes. "'What's going on here?' my father asked, his voice steady and authoritative. Nathan faltered under his gaze, but Mrs. Whitmore was undeterred. "'We're here to claim our rights to Leo.' My mother stepped forward, her voice calm but firm. "'You have no rights here. You lost them the day you turned your backs on Evelyn and her child.' The lawyer began to interject, but my father cut him off. "'I think you should leave.' This matter can be settled legally, not by intimidation or coercion. As the tension escalated, I glanced at Leo playing in the corner, blissfully unaware of the storm around him. My resolve hardened. I would not, I would not let their toxic presence touch his life. Suddenly, Nathan lunged towards Leo, his desperation clear. I just want to see my son. But before he could reach him, my father intervened, his police training kicking in. With a swift move, he restrained Nathan his years of experience evident. Mrs. Whitmore shrieked, Assault, we'll have you arrested for this. My father looked at her, undaunted. I'm protecting my grandson. If you continue this, I'll be forced to involve the authorities. Defeated and realizing they were outmatched, Nathan and Mrs. Whitmore left, their threats and bluster deflating as they exited the door. In the aftermath, my parents stood by me, their presence a bulwark against the chaos. As I hugged Leo, a sense of peace enveloped me. The battle was over, at least for now. I had stood up to the Whitmores, protected my son, and in doing so found a strength I never knew I had. The days that followed were a return to normalcy, the shadow of the Whitmores slowly fading into a distant memory. Leo's laughter filled the house, a balm to the wounds of the past. In time, I realized that the best revenge was not in defeating the Whitmores, but in building a life full of love and happiness with Leo a life they could never taint. We had emerged from the ruins stronger and more united, a testament to the enduring power of love and family. And as I watched Leo grow, his bright eyes full of curiosity and joy, I knew that no matter what the future held, we were ready to face it together. The Whitmores had tried to break us, but in the end they only made us stronger.